Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar. We'll just let a few more people um, filter into today's session. Um, so today's topic um, that, we, that we're pitching is kind of for educational purposes or houses of worship. Um, but most of the content that we kind of have planned to, to go through today, we have actually talked about uh, in all of the previous webinars, with the exception of media servers. So I will be starting there um, this afternoon. Um, as always, any questions, feel free to pop those in the chat. And if there's any topics that you'd like me to cover specifically, uh, feel free to start typing those um, pretty much now and uh, we can uh, go through those um, topics uh, that you might want to chat about. So we've got a few more people coming in. Ben's with me as always on the uh, on the chat. Just wait for Daniel to come in, then we'll begin. That one might have frozen. He's he's just stuck been there. stuck on joining for a while, so he might have okay. well, ran into an issue. So go with let's it. say go ahead. People from all over the world today, it's good. Okay, so I'm using the same demo show file um, that we've been looking at before in the in the webinars. Uh, but one additional thing that I've got going in WYSIWYG today is um, some media service screens. Um, I'm actually running Green Hippo media server on this PC, um, but if you're working with media servers, um, the way that you control them in Vista, the way that they're programmed, imported, and everything else is exactly the same. So just because I'm using a specific brand today doesn't mean that you couldn't use uh, another brand. Um, it's completely up to you. As long as it can be controlled by DMX or Artnet, then it would work in the exact same way. Um, so. I'll just show you how they work first in terms of how we program them in Vista, and then we'll go back and show you how we can set it up. So let me just move my zoom bar out of the way. Okay, so in here, I've got some media layer fixtures, just like a fixture, like a moving light or anything like that. Um, so we can click on a layer to control it. And then we're using the same Vista controls as before. So if I give this some intensity, this brings up my layer of which I've edited the home preset to bring up the Vista free logo here. So I have generic control over intensity, uh, position, color, and then other features such as zoom webinar controls are in the way for me today. So we can zoom this in and out as well. So that's pretty much all of the sort of generic controls. The only other one is the actual content itself. And that's found in the Gobo tab here. And we've got two folders. We've got a folder and file structure. And just like any custom DMX channel, we can actually click into the header or double click it and it opens up the uh, custom feature browser. So we're in media folder five and you can pick and choose content. If I can arrow up the different folders, just find some folders that do actually have some content. Here we go. So I can choose uh, some content on the server. Uh, I'm just gonna change layer on this one. Let's take that out of there, pop it in there. Unless I don't actually have any content in that slot, it's possible. Let me just try something else. We'll go with this one here. So this is the background content. Uh, so we can select the content here. So we're just choosing the image that we want to based on files and folders. So let's go for red stars. So this can be the background here. A lot of the other media server control points are custom DMX channels. So you can see all of the different modes here. Uh, for example, you might want to change uh, playback speed. You can just change 
the atoms here or the in and the out points or another good one is mix mode should be in here somewhere well, it's actually that's in the beam tab so in the beam tab we can find mix mode and then if you press this again you've got all the different mix modes of the server so this the software is just showing the ranges of what you were pressing. So if you want to change this from Sprite to Lighten or Darken, you can see that's changing the mix modes of what we've got. So now the background is coming in here. I'm not going to go into any more detail of the actual programming of the media server and all these settings. I'm just pointing out that this is how you access the modes within Vista. You literally double click the tab and it opens up the custom feature browser and then you can uh, pick and choose which one you want. Let's just get rid of all of these again. And we'll just stop these here as well. If I just go back and show you some of the uh, other content here, let's just go up a folder. Oh. I'm just going to change my mix mode again on this layer to become lighten. One of the cool things about working with media servers uh, with Vista is you can copy and paste between layers. So we can still do control C and copy this to the other three layers. So then you could start to still fan these uh, just like you can. So I'm fanning these three layers. We could make it go yellow, cyan and magenta. Because of the generic fixture model, uh, we can still apply lighting effects to these. So if I just home the position for a minute, oops, uh, home the position on these guys. The color's changing because it's adding, adding the color. Let's just do a new circle effect on these. So you can see they're doing a circle effect. Let's make it a little bit bigger. The cool thing is that we can take this look we've made on a media server and do something like control C. So you want to copy this CMY circle. If I just zoom out over here, I should be able to paste this onto different fixtures and it will do the same CMY circle on whatever technology you're controlling so we're taking this genetic look here so something to bear in mind if you do want to control the state state accurately you can just select all um, fixtures so if I select all of my lights here I'll take them here and here as well and let's say if we do some lifetime of five seconds and it's going to stop all of these effects and go green then it will fade to that in in that time. So this is just an example of using the generic model to control the media server layers and any of the fixtures that you have selected. So Jack, a question that came up is mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you patch a media server? Yeah, it's a good, uh, good question and a good uh, link into the next little bit. So depending on the media server, um, they often have different components in them. Um, depending on what brand of product you're looking at. I'm just using the actual layer control here, um, which if I can show you. Yeah, so the layer control basically just means that I'm patching this one layer would control this layer of the media server. The second one is this one, third one, and, and so on. There are other elements that you can patch in servers, such as the overall sort of like master control and, and these types of things. So within Vista, if we just pull this back up, it's, it's done just as a fixture um, somewhere else. If we go and find where uh, this fixture is patched, here it is. It's in um, universe 10 and you search for them just like you would any other fixture. So in this case, it's a 4.21 layer. So I would just patch a number of these fixtures just like I would a moving light. 
you can see those are the components that I was talking about a minute ago if I did want to use them, but I've chosen not to in this example. So you literally drag them in like this and they appear in the layout as a normal fixture. Initially though, when doing this, you won't see any thumbnails. So you won't see these images into this section. These will just be blank by default. You have to load those in separately and you basically download them from the server. You request them as thumbnail images. And then this is stored in your uh, Vista data folder. To import them, what you do is you press um, patch and you come down to import media server thumbnails. Now this isn't gonna show up on this machine because I'm just using it on a single computer, but normally what would happen is your media servers would show up as a row here. You would just select the server that you want to import and you press import media server thumbnails. That takes a couple of minutes to download them and then they sit locally on your host computer or console, depending on what you're using. So the last thing that we need to do is we need to um, assign those thumbnail folders to the media server. And the way that we do that is actually within the patch screen, but it's not, you don't do it from here. You actually do it from the actual source of the fixture, which in this case is here. So if you right click, um, there's an option to use custom media. And then this pops up the um, images folder within your Vista Free folder and in media server thumbnails. So what this is showing me here, this is two media servers that I previously downloaded on this machine. Um, if I'd have just imported them from here, it would say something like this in that row that was missing. So all we do now is we just select this folder, the top level root structure, and then that will assign it. If I just show you what's in here, it's just all of the um, images. It's a bad example, there's nothing in that one. Or that one. I'll show you in the actual um, browser. Uh, but then basically once you've assigned them, that's then how it knows to um, put this structure here. If I just see if I can show you. Uh, the actual resource. Yeah, so here's, here you'll see the actual folders of the content that it's assigning when you're doing that. Some media servers don't support CITP. Most of them do these days, but there's still some out there that um, don't. Um, if you go over to our user forum, I did actually do a pretty long post there in the past, which shows you how you can manually build these folder structures if you want to assign that to a media server that doesn't have CITP. Just by manipulating those folder structures, this doesn't actually care what um, what's in there. So you can just put normal images in and um, essentially get this visual workflow if that's what you want to do. So what happens if you change the content that's on the media server? Does it dynamically change? No, it's not. No, it's so it's a, it's a one-time thing. So it's, you're basically taking a snapshot of what's on that server at the, at the time you do the uh, import media server thumbnails. So if you do change the content, you would need to re-download from this and reapply in the same way that I've just shown you. It's not. Um, it's not automatically synced. It's a one-time thing. Advantages to that is it means that you can still program visually in Vista even when the media server is offline because the images are actually living on the host Vista machine. They're not constantly being sent from the from the server. Any questions, more questions on, on that? Pretty much the same for something like the NTEC ELM. We're using that with Pixelmator. I'm not familiar with that one. Is, is that a media server? I don't know. ELM is the media server. Okay. I, I would say yes, if it supports CITP, it would download the thumbnails. Um, it should patch just like any other fixture. Yeah, just like this. Is it in the library? What did you say it was called? ELM. 
Entech. It's Entech, is it? Yeah, well, you're right there. I'm not in the latest library, by the way, but. TEC. Oh. Actually, it's TT, two T's. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, fair enough. There we go. Oh, hey, let's have a look. Yeah, so it looks pretty much the same. So you can see it's uh, a media server. It's got uh, clip select and clip select two. I'm not sure what way it is in the actual um, way of doing it. Although it is important to mention, um, perhaps this is an example of it. This just looks like it's got two file structures. The way the actual property of this fixture works is it needs to have a folder and a file. They can't. They work in um, synergy with each other. Even if the even if the media server technically doesn't have a folder DMX channel, the profile still needs to have one. Even if it's just in there and not assigned to a natural DMX output channel, the profile still needs to have it. So sometimes in the media server, fixture profile is automatically imported from Carol, and that sometimes might not be the case, which it looks like it might be here because we've got two media uh, files. So if you are using this and having some issues with it, um, send us an email on the support ticket and we might be able to uh, adjust that for you. That's just me taking a guess from looking at these just here. Mm. Everything else looks pretty good. Any other questions on uh, media servers? There are not. Wow. That was pretty much it. So with that, I'm going to open up the chat to any other generic questions that you would like me to uh, touch on. Or I can just start repeating some of the stuff that we uh, talked about in our very first webinars, almost with the introduction to, to Vista. I'm going to pause for a moment. Yeah, this is the chance for anyone who's got questions about other things, even going back to previous webinars. Uh, most of what we've covered already has been covered uh, a lot in the past, so uh, without just repeating or the same the same content again, it's uh, you know this is the chance if you got anything that you want to see, uh, speak now. Will wants to see time code once through MTC. I don't know if you're set up for that on this, on this machine. Uh, not on this machine because I've switched for the media server example. Um, although after this, we should be uploading my webinar from yesterday where we did. Was that your video? We did that time code. You, we did, you did time code from MTC, right? I did LTC converting to MTC. Yeah, right. And you did MTC directly through. Uh, Loop meeting. Yeah through that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm afraid I'm on the wrong computer to demo exactly that feature. I can demo time code with the internal clock, but other than that, it's not really, um, we haven't got any third party sources right now. So to answer, to Will, to answer your question, uh, there's a couple different apps that will convert MTC to LTC. Uh, I used one called LTC Reader Converter. Uh, there's another one called Show Cockpit. Uh, they both will take the LTC on the audio input of the computer and convert it to MTC to put it to Vista. Uh, yesterday's webinar, we did that, and we'll have to upload those. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, on my machine this afternoon, for me, I'll be able to cover that a little bit more because I have that kind of all set up still. Um uh, the wig console demo being used with V3, how do I go about set up with this on my, using my V3 laptop? That's a good question. Um, 
assuming everyone else is happy just to kind of go off uh, subject almost and just take a look at that, I can show you how that works. Um, so I'm using it on one machine currently. Um, so let's just take a little look at that. We can close this down from here. Um, so first and foremost, this is goes for any um, application where you're kind of going internally in the computer. Um, I need to change the network settings of my um, computer so I can open network and internet settings. Uh, this is a Windows example. Um, Mac's a little bit different, but WYSIWYG's Windows only, so we'll go with it. You need to press change adapter options. And we need to add a um, loopback adapter, which would be, I've already got it set up here, it would be this one. Um, actually, no, that's not true. I don't have a loopback adapter on this. You need, you need to add a loopback adapter. You don't need it because you're connected to Wi-Fi. Yeah, and I'm coming back in. Um, yeah. Let me just try <laughs> something. If you don't have Wi-Fi connected and you don't have a physical switch connected, you'll need to add that loopback adapter. Okay, so I can I can show you how to do that. Um, again, you can Google how to do this, um, but the instructions to do it, uh, press this start button, um, type HD WWIZ, or just find the add hardware wizard just here. Um, you want to hit next. You want to install from a manual. You want to then come down to network adapters. A little list will then load. You need to select Microsoft. And then if you just scroll down, you should see here, uh, test loopback adapter. So this will install this. Here we go. So now in this, um, you can see it's here. So this is a loopback adapter. This needs to be enabled on your machine. Um, so this will come up. We can just check the um, IP configuration. It will be defined image range by default. You can change it, but typically you don't need to. So we're gonna use this. So the first thing we need to do is we need to point Vista in this network adapter direction. That's done from file, user preferences, um, in the network tab. And you can see I was currently on Wi-Fi, um, which was a bad example. <laughs> we never recommend doing that. It just so happened to default to that because I have no other network physically connected on this machine right now. Um, so if we choose the interface, Ethernet free is this loopback adapter that we've just added. So we're telling Vista to use this. If we change this, it will be prompted to restart the application. So that's okay. We can close that. And I'm just going to close another little bit of software as well. Now I always use this next bit of software just because I, it's a historical thing. I'm just used to doing it. WYSIWYG does support ArtNet directly in, but to be honest, I personally still use this little um, sort of bridge. It's called Luminex Wiggalizer. You can download it from the Luminex website. Um, so you press this, a little box pops up and we need to specify the IP address that we want to use. So this is the Wi-Fi, uh, and this is that loopback adapter address. So we want to use this as well. And that'll just run in the background. And then we can open the WYSIWYG uh, demo. You can download this from the website. Um, this is the free demo version for our Vista demo show file. You want to click WYSIWYG console demo. Click OK. And then select the demo file that's on the Vista website, Vista free demo wig file. And this will load up. So here it is. I'm just going to start my Vista software now. Okay, so this is playing. If we just go to um, WIG, I can just check in the connected universes if this is actually connected and sending something out, which it is. So let's go back to WIG. 
so we're good from here. All we need to do now is tell this to connect to the ArtNet. That's done in WYSIWYG by pressing Managers and Device Manager. And in this show file by default, there is a protocol called Ethernet DMX, which basically is that Luminex uh, Wiggleizer port. So you don't need to change anything if you're using our own demo show that's already here. All you need to do is press connect and then you should have that connection in there. If it doesn't connect, it means that the Luminex Wiggleizer is not running. And if it connects and you don't see any output, then you possibly have an issue with where Vista thinks it's sending its network data to. That's pretty much it for that. So Stephen brought up a question about best practices between bouncing, best practices bouncing between QLIS. Uh, uh, we've, we've we've covered that in the past, but I don't know if it's. Uh, we can do it again. Yeah, it's good. Pop through I mean, that. And yeah, just... I mean, it's it's good. I mean, that's almost on. The, <laughs> that's almost on topic of going between different um, uh, looks and your performance, certainly in the kind of worship kind of thing. So let's see if I can do an example. Oops. Okay, so let's just go to a different page. Uh, oops, over here. Cool. So let's make uh, song one uh, on this playback over here. So let's just label this song one. And this can be like the preset of this queue. The best advice that we could probably give is always to start and end on the same sort of preset state. So if I want to make an example here, of let's say these rises on and we'll just bring in these at some intensity. So this is the sort of my preset state. Uh, I'm just gonna actually store a preset of this as well. So let's store this as a preset of page preset. And we'll just store this uh, somewhere. So I've actually got this stored now somewhere. So I can use this again later. Here it is, stage preset. So we're making sure that this is actually stored into the queue itself, which is good. Um, and then from here, we can actually go into transition of the song. So let's pretend we want a blackout to begin with. So we just program uh, a blackout. Obviously we can turn all these lights off. And then from here, we're good to actually start programming what we want our lights to, uh, to be doing. Let's just go back to my position there. Set up. Shrink these down a bit. Let's go for the button position. Who cares? Obviously, you can copy and paste between stuff as well, and these are all referencing the uh, the preset, so you can do whatever you want uh, with this sort of stuff. Uh, let's bring in. Uh, I don't know this as well. I mean like this, it doesn't really matter um, what's happening. Uh, and then we can do a blackout again. In fact, first let's do a move in black because we're going to see these lights uh, coming into position here. So we'll just do a control M, mark you to put that move in the blackout. So then we don't see these lights moving. They're already in position in their color just here. So let's pretend we want to do a blackout again after that, and then we'll do the preset after that. So I'm just dragging and dropping to change this. So it's my simple show, blackout, then the first cue, and then uh, uh, blackout again. And, uh, and then back to the preset. So that's kind of one list done. If we do another quick example of uh, this one. So again, we'll start with that same uh, preset that we had before. So if I just go find that without any fixture selected, I can just click it and it puts all of these lights into that set look. Put these on as well. Um, so we'll call this preset. 
this time we won't do a blackout, but we'll go straight into the next um, state, if you like, it doesn't matter what. Doesn't matter what's happening here. So now obviously you're getting that nice transition from here to here because it's within a single cue list. So you're gonna you're just gonna see the lights change colour and these lights fly up. We'll just leave it at that. So the idea with this, um, to make this easier, um, I'm just gonna put release buttons on these as well. So the idea with it is if I want to transition from, uh, in fact, let me just put the preset at the end of this one as well. The idea is um, if we want to go from one to two, we can play one. So here it is. Uh, we go to the blackout uh, and then we go back to that preset state. Um, you can just press preset from here and you won't see any change on stage because these two are exactly the same, which means that once you've got this playing, you can uh, release that one and just carry on from from there. That's the best example that I could give of being able to trans transition from one, one to the other. Um, of course, you can also put commands in here to automatically turn off the other one. We talked about that as well. So we could put an insert command to release the previous list or release all except if you um, want to use that as an example. Oops. So what would happen now in song two, if we still play the, the preset, you press play on this now, this completes. Mm, that's the same, <laughs> did I put release all in there? No, I did the wrong list. I did release against two, <laughs> not four. Four, yeah. So now you would play this, it completes, releases that, but you don't see any change, it's the same thing. And then you can just move on directly from there. Did that make any sense at all? I assume so, I wasn't paying any attention. Uh, yes, <laughs> Steven said yes, he got it. Seems like uh, we need like smooth, same preset beginning of each list. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah exactly, yeah. yeah. Or <laughs> if it's a blackout, I mean, it doesn't have to be a preset, it could be a blackout, it could be you know, the same cue. Yeah. Uh, yep, just uh, let's answer a couple of questions about uh, WYSIWYG demos. Uh, yeah, the only other thing you need for that is Luminex, the Wiggleizer, which uh, the, the show file, both the Vista and the, and the WYSIWYG show files are on the website. Uh, not Wiggleizer, that you have to download from Luminex. I'm not sure if there's a reason why we need to have it from Luminex. How do I make a solo cue list that doesn't turn off, say, a cue list with cue lighting? Ooh, getting into priorities there. What was the question there again, Ben? Or, re I, or, 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 re okay. uh, or reword the question if you want. How do I make a solo cue list that doesn't turn off a cue list with key lighting? So basically, yeah, solo okay, a list, yeah. but not solo the key lighting. It's actually your really good question there too. If I do this as a demonstration, so if I do red, green, and uh, blue in uh, this example, let's just uh, change the zoom down on these guys. So we've got red, green, and blue on this list. And if I do another list of these guys here. Just a question, Ben? Well, how, how do I make sure this on an LTP basis doesn't interfere with this? So I've got my singer Q list, these four white. If I press list five Q2, these white ones are gonna change to green on an LTP basis. So they're gonna keep fighting. Is this the question? Uh, no, I think it's more about uh, uh, if you have a Q list, but you wanna solo something else, like say you wanna solo the blinders, but not lose the key lights. Um, 
I mean, the honestly, the, the, the best option there would probably have two separate cue lists, a cue list for a key lighting and a cue list for everything else. Then a cue list would actually be three cue lists and then one for the blinders. But even if you soloed this list now on this, um, on this flash here, it's always going to pull out everything. There's not a way of ignoring this solo flash button, um, if that's what you mean. There's no way of saying, don't ever turn off this list five when I press the solo flash. The only way to do that is you would have to you'd have to manually program um, a flash at a higher priority, not including these lights. So you'd actually have to do it as a list, not this action. If that answers your question. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. What solos. Yes. Yeah, solos console wide. There's no. There's no ignore solo. Like there is ignore snapshot or something like that. That might be a better, uh, Do better I explanation of that. <clears throat> yeah. I, I mean, in, in Dimitri's question, it's about priority. Uh, yeah, yes and no. I mean, it's, it's also the solo feature is console-wide, so it won't really matter much on priority. Uh, but, yeah. I guess I'd have to be, you have to see an example of situation. Uh, one more follow on about bouncing between if you have a main look list, just, oh, okay. If you have a main look list, speakers walk in, just keep that active the whole time. And in that case, release all except to probably wouldn't work since you could only keep one list active. Um, yeah, release all except is going to, you know, release everybody except for that one. Uh, when we have um, ignore release, so let's say, for example, this is the, um, the singer here. Um, so if I now play this song two, when I press play on this, it's going to play the preset. And then when it gets to here, it's going to release this cue list as well, because that's what this command does. You can change that in the properties of this six. Um, oops. Um, and you can still use the ignore release all option for that. That's not just a release all release all except is still classed as a release all because uh, it's the same thing. So if you turn this on, release, ignore release all. In this example, uh, if we do the same thing again, the singer or whoever turns up, we now go into song two. This now doesn't release uh, this list. But what you may find happening as we progress into other cues is, um, oh, we didn't use those lights in this example. I can do an example here in song one, I think, because I use the same lights. Okay, here you see the color change and the gobo change here. Um, this is because this is working on an LTP basis. So this is the last thing that I changed. So therefore it's changed the color or gobo. That's why you could also use priority to help you with that. So if this is the most important person in the whole event, you want to make sure he's staying lit as he is programmed in this fader, and you can increase the priority of this to be above everything else. And that's this top option here. So we can um, increase that and uh, we're still seeing the color change. The reason we're still seeing the gobo in this example is simply because there isn't any gobo stored in this six. Um, so that is actually doing the correct information. That's is pulling the gobo from here. If I want to change that, I just have to make sure that I programmed open slot gobo in this state. So that's just something to be, uh, be aware of. Was that useful in any way? <laughs> I'm sure it was. That was a great example. Uh, yeah, hitting with priorities there briefly. Uh, what, next week, I think we're going to go through properties? Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, yeah, so yeah. Whilst, whilst mentioning it now, we're going to go through the rest of all this stuff and everything else in here uh, next week. I don't want to get into that too much today, just for doubling content. Any questions specific to, um, I guess, the webinar topic titles for type of educational establishments or houses of worship that you want us to retouch on? I don't want to feel like I'm shortchanging anybody. I'm 
Not at the moment. Maybe everybody's running out trying to get their WYSIWYG and Vista to work together. Right <laughs> yeah. now. Oops. Can you guys see my screen again then? Yes. Cool. How can I save all personal settings and always carry them with me to put them in a new console? Depends what um, settings you mean. Um, there was a significant change in Vista 3 that a lot of the settings um, actually come with the the show file itself. Um, they're all wrapped in a single container, so most of the stuff comes in there. Um, but the only additional stuff that I could possibly talk about is if you have a show file saved with how you like your settings, um, we would actually could merge that in as part of the merge function. So if I just show you something here, let's just click on a show file. With the show file, ignoring all of this stuff, the actual contents of the actual show file, you can see um, there's a couple of other what I would define as personal settings at the bottom, user preferences, uh, soft key assignments. So the soft key assignments uh, are the F keys at the top, how these are assigned. Um, quick picker layouts and window layouts. So these last two options are simply, um, what do you like to see in these boxes? Um, how big do you like this? Do you like it on the left? Do you like it on the right? All those sort of personal preferences. Um, so if you do turn up to a show file already pre-programmed and existed that someone else has made, there's actually nothing to stop you merging in these preferences. These settings are actually the start of a user profile, though it's not defined as such. It's basically the same thing. You can just tick these options. Um, but other than that, the settings of the user preferences actually come with the show file. So all of these things actually uh, come with it. So I go and popping through uh, the, the merge shows, that might be uh, something worth just touching on here too. Yeah, I mean, it's a good, um, it's a good point. Uh, and almost <laughs> it does fit on topic, certainly if you've got different show files for different um, uh, events in worship. Let's have a little look. Just seeing that last question about the WYSIWYG thing. Uh, we'll post this webinar to YouTube um, possibly later today so you can just go back and I pretty much demoed it in this video how to connect it up. So you should just be able to follow that. Do, 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 do. So I'm just going to save this show file so you can come back to it. Uh, this is webinar demo one. And if we just do uh, another queue list, let's release this. Oops. Can you guys still hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Can still hear. Uh, what haven't we used? Oh, we use these. It's okay. Okay, so this is list seven with these three cues um, in here. Um, let's save that. I'm going to save this as uh, webinar demo two. Here it is, webinar demo two. So if I go back to um, save show, 
if I go back to webinar demo one, we should see that this um, isn't included in this because we didn't store it. So what we can do is we can merge it in. So if I do file, merge show, select it, we can then just go find that QDIS that uh, we've just want to merge in. So it was list seven. Um, so all those are the other lists. Um, if it does do replaces, it'll tell you what it's going to replace. It's replacing these because it's actually the same thing. Um, whereas if they were different lists with the same ID numbers, the ID numbers would change to probably be 101, 102, and so on and so forth. So we can import things like queue lists, um, I never show components, presets, etc. In this example, the only thing that I'm selecting is the list itself, list seven. So if I import list seven, I should be able to open that and see exactly what I've just programmed before. And these lights have been automatically added to the contents of this. And the best bit of information that I can tell you in the webinar for this merge function when we're importing queue lists uh, or indeed fixtures is that when we program on fixtures in Vista, we actually use like a hidden serial number of the fixtures, um, which is invisible to the user. It's just what the software is keeping track of throughout. And because this show file was based Show file two was based on show file one. So therefore it's the exact same serial numbers that are in use. So therefore when I import just the queue list contents, it knows that what programming should be in there for um, these fixtures. Whereas if I do another example, if I do a new show file, let's just patch some of those vipers for a minute. So they're 10 Vipers, they're the same mode, they're the same fixture number, they're even patched at the same place. It's these guys just here. If I do file merge show and do that same example again, just selecting the list seven, we're gonna merge this in. We've got list seven, but this is actually just the contents of the, the empty list, it's just the, queue names, titles, timings, the actual content of it is missing. So if the show files aren't based off the same original DNA with the exact same serial numbers, you won't actually get any programming coming into it. To do that, what you have to do is you have to merge the show file in. You have to select the queue list, but you also have to select the fixtures that you want them to have with this, which is these, uh, 10 fixtures just here. So if we just merge these, you can now see I've got the uh, additional ones here. And now because we've done both, then you will see the programming on, on these. So that's the best kind of bit of information that perhaps isn't necessarily too clear if you're just looking at release notes or that type of stuff. But other than that, it works exactly the same as what I've just demonstrated it. And the nice thing about Vista's merge function is you can just keep repeating it. It's not a one-time operation. You can do it multiple times with the same show file or even different show files and bring in uh, what you want to do. Question just popped up. Uh, where are those fixtures patching when you bring them in like that? Are they patching? Uh, it depends um, how they were patched in the show file. Um, so you can see here that they were patched because this space was available uh, in the patch. If there was something here in my show file, these fixtures will be dropped to the pool. So it depends. If they can fit, they'll be patched. If they can't fit, they'll drop to the pool. There was a question earlier on here. Let me look back here. Uh, how do you have your screen arranged? How do you have your screens arranged for programming, live shows, time code shows? Uh, he has the S1 and M1 with three screens. <laughs> so screen, uh, screen real estate is not going to be a problem for you. We, we did talk about that in some detail on the, one of the webinars. 
last week was it Ben last Thursday I think it was yeah um, and I think that's on YouTube already but maybe just point out the view menu and yeah so, so you're not going to be able to show it no, you know, on a monitor attached let, let me just pull up my uh sure if I have all my stuff I can show you on the one screen it really doesn't doesn't matter um firstly I'll be using workspace snapshots to help you manage this so let's imagine this is your programming time code window because you want to be working in the edits and doing all that type of stuff so I can record a snapshot um let's call it programming you want to record window workspace. So this would always recall this. Uh, actually, I've already got one made up. So if I press this sort of busking view, then it's changing my view to what I want for sort of live playback. So I've got sort of big sort of groups that I can do um, all sort of presets on. I can do timings. This is a snapshot of live timing. They're quickly changing this view uh, up here. Uh, yeah, so that's basically it. And to set this screen up, you're just adding dockable windows, dragging these around to wherever you want them to be in the space, choosing your contents that you want to see there. And yeah, and that's basically it. So if we were record a new one now of, say, busking 2, <laughs> I really can't type, that would always recall this layout. If we go back to the programming view, we'd go back to this. If I go to my keypad snapshot it's going to come back to this so it's really uh, really up to you and there's no right or wrong way of doing that by the way it's whatever works for you but typically big touch screen situations work best for live playback can you quick show where you um and the external monitors so uh, under the view menu where you have external monitors so if you have multiple monitors where you'd enable or disable those so they're here, they're grayed out in my example because I only have one screen connected. You will be able to see both external monitor one and two. And in release three, which will be coming out shortly, you've also got this sort of space in the main application as well. Is it possible to save strikes and dowels as a, a fixture lamp in AQ? Um, yes, it is, but it's not through, um, the actual macro commands itself. Let me just come back to my um, programming. So if I go to a queue and if I'm triggering the strike DAOs, this is just doing it live. It's not actually programming these commands into um, this queue. There's nothing in here. Um, but if you go to the control channel, which is typically in the custom tab, um, and under miscellaneous, we tend to hide these. So custom misc, you've then got the control channel. So again, you can pop open this custom browser, just like I was showing you with the uh, media servers. And normally there's a lamp macro in here if it's defined, um, or we can actually just cheat this and go look at the um, macro tab here. So this is 26 at 42 for the strike command here. So the only way you can get that into a queue is if you literally just type that command. Oh, is that? Did I miss it? Oh, it's here. Sorry. <laughs> it's here. So you can literally just tap uh, tap this, and it will be programming that value. And then, because we place this in here, then this is in the queue itself. Just lamp on. Same for reset or um, lamp off. That's a good one. A custom feature browser. Um, so you're literally clicking it. So you're opening the tab here. So if a fixture has got ranges, you can just click it and it opens up the ranges. So you can see that for things like control channels. You'd also see it for things like uh, media servers. If we click on something here again. So here it's the same thing, or pixel mapped fixtures such as these. In the beam, I could be able to select my patterns. So I'm literally just clicking the header and you can choose the different sort of pixel effects if the fixture supports that, of course. So you just, you're just clicking into it. 
same for strobe. So a question came up here is, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm reading other questions too. Uh, yes, there's, there's a lot more power in that custom browser. Uh, if you're running 10 lights in a position effect and need to disable two of them to use for something different, and then release that back into the list or release that back in the original effect. So I think if I have just... 10, 10 light in a position effect. Oh yeah, exactly. That's just an LTP uh, thing. So we can just do that as an example. Um, let's get what we're going again. Of lifetime. So these lights are doing their uh, effect, say, up in the air, which is cool. So we like this is the uh, effects cue list. We can save that. And if I do another cue list, Let's say you want these lights here to uh, stop that effect and go down to the singer. So it's this. Just works on an LTP basis. So uh, we've got my release buttons. So we've got the uh, effects running here on this first list. If I now press the singer list, these four lights should transition and stop their effect because this is the last action. So therefore, if I release this action, this is going to release from here and return to doing whatever it was doing last, which in this case is the position effect. Does that answer the question? I believe so, from my understanding of the question. So we're just about just about through all of our time here. So let's say this is a last call for any questions. Can you do that in one queue list, or do you need need two queue lists? You could do it as two queues, exactly the same. Um, as an example, so if I do my effects, uh, I'll do the same thing. I'm going to add a new queue. I'm going to select my lights. I'm going to press uh, stop effects, put them in my singer, and that's literally it. So you could just go through these. You could just loop around these two because the default play action is to loop around. So we've got one. Press play. It goes to two. Stops. Press again. It comes back up. And as for the question on webinars, we've done a lot of webinars so far. Uh, they're on our YouTube page as well. So a lot of the stuff that we've, we're hitting here have been, has been covered in the past as well. Uh, we have another one for next week, another couple for next week. Uh, one of the questions, sometimes on colors, there's problems with mixing custom colors. That's a, which custom colors? I would assume things that are not RGB. Ah, but any, is there any, whoever asked the question, do you have a specific color or a specific fixture that makes you ask that question? That might be a good question to send in to, uh, to us at support. So we can go through it. That's probably a little something that's more specific to a fixture profile. So anyway, with that, I'd say we're probably at, uh, at our time. Oh, color macros are generally different. Color macros typically are on the fixture firmware handling, um, which often if you do a color macro on a fixture, it kicks out the actual color mixing system of the fixture. So it might be some, uh, some stuff like that.
it's tricky to answer it without seeing the actual fixture. Feel free to send us an email to support and we'll check them out. I'll just answer Richard's question quickly. So, uh, So from here, I'll just bring in these blinders just for demonstration. So we follow and follow time. Basically, follow starts counting from the completion of the previous queue, whereas start starts counting from the start of the previous queue. So in this example, a follow time of one second would look like this. The red lights would complete in two seconds then the console would wait one second and then follow. Whereas if we do a start, because that's because it's completed, then it counts at this point, then goes. Whereas with start, um, you can see it's adjusted because it's starting counting from the beginning. So it's recalculated for the queue time of one. Whereas if I do a start of one, what would happen here is one second into this queue, this is also going to be triggered. So halfway through, you can see it's triggering this as well. It doesn't mean that Q1 is going to snap to the end of its stage state. Um, those will continue to fade. Um, so starts might be useful if you want to do a quick uh, flash or something. You might want to just start this 0 0.2 seconds into that rather than having to calculate Q time. Basically starts from the beginning, follows from the end. That was good. Cool. Well, thanks for the uh, interactive questions, guys. That was good. And um, yeah, we'll put it on YouTube and hopefully see you on the next one.